Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live for November 2nd, 2020. I'm Joe Lynch. I am back here with the City Council update. As always, our guest is City Council President Matt McLaughlin, Ward 1 City Council Representative Matt McLaughlin. How are you this afternoon? I'm doing all right. How are you doing, Joe? Good. It's been a little bit. We took a little bit of a break, uh, both the council, the school committee, uh, the administration, everybody's been busy. So we have chalk block uh, agenda today. But first, I just want to give a uh, somewhat premature congratulations. Uh, my understanding is that the uh, city council met in caucus and took a straw poll. And uh, there is unanimous consent that uh, President Matt McLaughlin will continue in 2021 as city council president. Is that too premature or are you okay with that? Well, as long as I don't anger people within the next month, I should be president next year. Uh, so you can congratulate me and I thank you for that. Very good. And my understanding is that the current vice president of the board, uh, Mary Jo Rossetti, one of the counselors at large, will continue on in her role as vice president. Yes, yes, we make a good team, so. Very good, congratulations to both. Matt, you wanna do a little bit of a COVID update? Why don't I turn it over to you? Yeah, I'll just be very quick. You know, as everyone knows, unfortunately, COVID uh, cases on the rise nationwide. Uh, to date, Somerville has over 2,100, 2,180 confirmed cases. And unfortunately, I've had 48 fatalities. Um, and we're still dealing with the crisis. So I encourage people, as always, to wear a mask when you're outside, wash your hands, keep distance from people. Uh, all the same precautions that we've had in place. We've known that COVID would come back in the fall and it did come back. So we all just have to do our part to remain cautious. Uh, and I know that a lot of people are still struggling with rent and eviction, uh, people who have still been out of work or have lost time on the job. The city of Somerville has announced a $500,000 emergency housing fund uh, for rental and mortgage assistance, so for homeowners as well. So people can find that information on the city of Somerville's website, somervillema.gov. And that's all I have in terms of COVID. Um, we, like I said, we knew that this was going to happen. So people just have to continue to be cautious and exercise your discretion as much as possible. Thank you, Matt. Matt, a couple of more updates, and I, I know we may talk about it further on into the show um, for the business community. Um, there were a round of things that the city council, along with other entities in the city, did uh, last month in November. There was some relief that was given to the business community, the restaurateurs, the small business operators. And uh, I would encourage anybody who operates and owns a small business, including restaurants, to get a hold of the economic development team. There are some monies that will be uh, made available to them. Um, and the arts community, uh, I believe the city just announced an additional $500,000 in assistance for the arts community. Yeah, so like I said, uh, last month we added uh, $750,000 for local businesses. Uh, and we've also waived over $550,000 in fees for small businesses. So those are two steps we've taken. And then uh, just last week, we approved by I believe half a million dollars for the arts because uh, the arts were not uh, covered under any federal or state bailouts. So the city of Somerville took it upon themselves to do that. Great. Matt, I know you had on the agenda for today talking about uh, the appointment of an interim police chief, but I wanted to ask you about something that's very, very recent, which was a move by the House and the Senate on Beacon Hill about police reforms. Any thoughts on that and, and how that's going to shake out in terms of the city of Somerville? No, not right now. I just read that headline. So I have to learn more about what exactly the reforms are. Um, but yeah, we, we are now uh, getting ready to appoint an acting chief, police chief, uh, Charles Femino, who has been the acting chief police chief uh, a couple of times in the past. And unfortunately, we're losing Chief Fallon, who was the chief for quite a while here and did a really great job and addressed a lot of the reforms that they're probably talking about on the state level now. Uh, he implemented a lot of uh, big picture reforms in the city. So we're definitely gonna miss him and hope that we can find somebody to replace him. And, and just to be clear, I, someone asked me a question 
um, is uh, the new acting chief Femino coming back full time? My understanding is that he is not. This is an interim appointment. Well, he's going to be working full time, but he will not be the uh, he's not planning to be the new chief of police. He's here while we find a uh, suitable replacement for Chief Fallon. And, and I assume that we're going to be doing what we did in the past. it will be a nationwide search. Uh, but others on the current police force would be considered if they put their name in for application. Yeah, there, there will be a nationwide search, uh, just like in the past. And, uh, you know, I, I've seen at least three or four police chiefs come and go at this point in my, in my time since I've been paying attention to things like this. And, you know, the, the previous two were not from Somerville, but then we did a nationwide search and found Chief Fallon, who was in the police department already for many years. So it's really hopefully the best candidate uh, will get the job. Great. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about in terms of uh, reforms is something that you want to bring up, and I'll turn it over to you, is um, charter reform. And for those uninitiated, the cliff notes are um, the way the city government works here in Somerville, we are governed by our charter. The charter was established and was uh, amended and revised over the years, but that charter um, you want to take a good deep dive into how the charter operates. You want to take it over from there? Yeah, and it's just so people understand, you know, charter reform would be kind of like an amendment to the Constitution. So uh, on the federal level and the state level, we have our Constitution. In some of it, it's called a charter, and it basically governs how we operate as a city. And unfortunately, they have, there have been times in the past when the charter has been revised, but nothing substantive. And from my perspective and from the perspective of a lot of people, the balance of power is incredibly skewed in Somerville to the point that, you know, as someone who sits on the school committee and the city council as president, I sometimes question the meaning of our existence. Uh, it's an existential issue that, you know, uh, are we, people complain, you know, sometimes they'll say, oh, the city council's a rubber stamp or the school committee's a rubber stamp. And then you look at the rules and you find out that there's almost no choice but to be a rubber stamp sometimes, because even if you uh, go against the wishes of the executive branch, they can counter it uh, unilaterally, even if it was a unanimous decision, uh, which has happened several times in the past and not just this mayor, but in general, I think it's a systemic issue that, you know, our, you look at our state constitution, which was created by John Adams, who helped inform the federal constitution, they put, had this concept of checks and balances, but in a lot of cities in, in Massachusetts, the, the strong mayor system is just so powerful, there are no checks and balances. So that's kind of what I'm doing. And you know, we have the support of the mayor to move forward on it. We're waiting on an announcement of a charter uh, council committee to come up with, with recommendations and then it would come to the city council. And then there's a lot more steps to that. To that. But I think it's really important and for me, uh, after everything we've been able to do in the past few years, which I'm very proud of, a good step would be to change the way our government operates, if, uh, for not just us, but for future generations. Matt, I'm, I'm not trying to dumb it down, but I'm trying to understand um, the purpose of charter reform is, is to shift the balance of power. So right now we have a very, very strong mayoral form of government where the executive makes decisions, they bring it over to the council, and they have veto power if the council doesn't do what they want. I mean, is, is that the basis of the charter reform to kind of shift that balance? In my mind, it is. Uh, and other people may have different opinions because charter reform can also mean the way we handle elections, whether it's a two or four year term. It could mean having a city manager instead of a mayor. It could mean uh, many different things. Uh, which is why we're going to have not just myself, but a group of people look into this and then get input from the community and then have the council deliberate on it and the mayor. And then it also still has to go to the state legislature. So charter reform can mean many things, but for me, it means shifting the balance of power or at least creating a balance of power because right now there is no true balance. And I'll just give a few examples. You know, we, you say, you know, the mayor has veto power. But lots of times we could say we make a cut to the budget, which we're only allowed to make cuts 
We can't add to the budget. We can't reallocate funds. We can only request these things. We unanimously cut an item from the budget. The mayor can decide to cut something else or to reallocate funds to the point that even our entire budget process, which is one of the biggest uh, aspects of being a city councilor, is often meaningless because you, if you can just shift funds any way you want, what's the point of even having accountability? And the same goes for appointments where we have an, app an appointment process in the city where we confirm things like the planning board, zoning board, even police, fire department, things like that. Uh, we could cut, well, we can vote to reject an appointment, but the mayor can keep that appointment in position uh, indefinitely until he finds a replacement. So things like this are just issues that there are no checks and balances. It's very one-sided. And it, again, it has been an issue. This is not unique to the present situation. Prior mayors have done the same thing. Um, and it, if you have that power, you're going to exercise it. So my yeah. thing would be to uh, reduce that power and to have a little bit more accountability. Well, let me, let me try to contrast that, Matt, for a little bit with the way that the city government works over in Cambridge, which is a bicameral kind of form of government. They have a city manager and then they have a figurehead mayor um, and then they have this city council. So I guess what, what I'm trying to um, understand is where is the check and balance if you go to a city manager form of government and you have a very powerful city manager? How do you control the power the city manager has? Because in my, my collective memory, uh, he, I, I think it was Bob Healy, Robert Healy, who was the former city manager over in Cambridge. He was an extremely powerful executive wielding power like nobody had ever seen. And that the Cambridge City Council had very little to do with how he was managing the books or managing certain things. Can you kind of contrast that for me and what your vision for Somerville would be? Yeah, well, I think everything you just said is why uh, city manager is not the path I'm looking for. Uh, because just like in Cambridge, uh, Cambridge has a, um, they have a city manager, we have a strong elected mayor, and we both have the same problem, where basically the executive branch has so much power that it often feels like the city council is, you know, is not, does not have any ability to really check that power. So to me, it's not about city manager versus mayor. It's more about the balance of power there. So I, I would say if we had a city, if we decided to go with a city manager, I would still expect to have checks on that manager to make sure that uh, they don't have the power that to just completely ignore the council. And that's, that's my issue is like, uh, we're all here, the city council school committee, we're here to do work and sometimes it just doesn't feel like that we have the ability to even do the work we wanna do. So charter reform in your mind would still have some type of an executive, um, but are, are you considering or is the council thinking about eliminating um, the mayor's position and replacing that with something else, but with more of a balance of power, a check and balance between the legislative body and whoever the executive is, whether that winds up being a mayor or winds up being a, a city manager? Well, again, for me personally, and this is going to be a group decision, uh, but for me personally, it's not about creating a city manager or eliminating the mayor position. It's about checking the power of those positions. So if that's the path other people want to go on, we can discuss that. But to me, the issue is not that we have an elected mayor. It's that we have a very, very strong mayor system. Um, and that's what I would like to check. Uh I think I get where you're going with it, is that it, under our current charter, the mayor is given extraordinary powers. Yeah. And you want to kind of balance that out with the council. Yeah. Well, yeah. yes. And I'll give you another example of uh, just an issue that probably every city in this commonwealth is dealing with, is that we share a solicitor's office with the mayor. So we have the same legal counsel as the mayor. Um, and oftentimes we're at odds with each other. It's just a natural fact of checks and balances, again, that the executive and legislative branch have to be a check on each other. And we share a lawyer, but the lawyer is hired and fired by the mayor. So oftentimes we've asked for our own counsel 
and have not received that counsel. We ask for an appropriation to get our own representation and we get a return of an appropriation of $0. Um, and we're basically told by the solicitor's office uh, that we, they are our representative, but they have frequently in the past told us that they can't represent us because of a conflict of interest, but they won't give us our own lawyer. So that's Maddie, what I take up. Maddie, I hate the phrase, but the city solicitor's office appears to be serving two masters. I mean, they definitely, they do. They have, they represent two different bodies of government. And this isn't just some of them. This is probably every city in the Commonwealth. Uh, they represent two bodies of government and no executive wants to give up that power because they have control over the lawyers. And we're at their whim that even if we got our own lawyer, say we pooled our resources to get a lawyer or something, where it's not, doesn't carry the weight of a solicitor. So I would really think, um, <clears throat> My, my goal would be to address issues like that in charter. I, I'd like to have you know, a council solicitor, just like the school committee has presently, actually. So, so I'll wrap it up unless you have some other things to say on it. Would, would one of the goals of charter reform be to um, pare down or strip the executive office of executive order capability? Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, um, you know, I guess it would depend on the executive order. I'm thinking about the functions that the city council are currently responsible for that we have no power over. So something like the budget, something like zoning, something like appointments, uh, something like creating our laws and having them enforced. Those are the things that I'm really thinking about. I think there are situations where executive orders are needed and a strong mayor system is needed, such as you know COVID-19, this whole situation. Um, was assisted by the fact that we had a mayor who can make decisions on the spot. So I wouldn't want to strip. It's not about stripping power as much as it is enhancing our power and actually giving us a purpose because we all signed up to do work and it just doesn't feel good when you're doing all this work and it, it can be completely ignored. Well, you, I, you know, I joked with you before we came on air that, you know, in the position that you're in as president of the council and the position that I'm in with a couple of other organizations, whether you are the chair or the president, um, it is a balancing act for those of us who have leadership roles in there are times when we need to use our powers for quick action. Um, there are other times where it has to be discussed either with a board or a council or you know the public or anything like that so it is a balancing act but I, I i i've always advocated for charter reform i think we should be put on a schedule to be honest with you i mean every five years we should be yeah. mandated to look at our charter and react to what's going on in our community um things change well, yeah well a lot of cities have built into their charter a 10-year review so that's definitely something I'd like to have. And we did do charter reform about 10 years ago, uh, but it just didn't do what I was hoping it would do. Uh, so I'm hoping that this time around we have a more substantial charter reform. Great, that sets the stage. Best wishes. I know you're gonna try to bring that up next year and do something with well, it. I brought it up this year. So unfortunately, a lot of things got in the way. Uh, yeah. Part of it's understandable that we had a pandemic to deal with, but uh, this what is an important item. And one of those items, Matt, um, there's, you know, it's almost like a zipper effect where the, the teeth of one thing that the council has been working on, the city has been working on, is affordable housing. That has now come into a very critical focus with the evictions that are happening, people not having enough money to stay in their homes. You are um, actively working with the council on the affordable housing overlay system you want to kind of set the stage for that what you're going to be doing next year yeah and potentially well maybe not this year i guess but we're close to it um basically an affordable housing overlay would be a zoning change that would basically allow more affordable housing to get built 100 percent affordable housing and it basically re relieves some restrictions that would prevent affordable housing from getting built or lots of times as you know joe uh there's times when affordable housing developments get sued and get held up in court for years uh, because neighbors opposed it. And we're trying to eliminate things like that, try to 
allow affordable housing to get built without so much restriction. Uh, I wouldn't say it, it's not a silver bullet and it's not gonna solve all the problems, but at the very least, it's gonna help uh, nonprofit affordable housing developers to build without so many onerous restrictions. So let me, <clears throat> let me try to juxtapose that, Matt, from me growing up here in Somerville. When we talked about affordable housing, um, my, you know, my, my age group, we would equate that with public housing. And, and the, the thing that I've been wondering about, and I'm still wrestling with it, is with this new affordable housing overlay system, uh, you would be designating certain areas in the city that would be allowed to do things for 100% affordable housing or a majority affordable housing. Do we run the risk of recreating sections of the city that have a moniker as public housing in it? Am I phrasing the question correctly? That by I understand what you're getting at, yeah. Yeah. Well, one, this would be public housing because it's housing that's uh, subsidized by the federal and state government. That's kind of a requirement to be qualified for this. But this would be a citywide policy. It wouldn't be designated to just one area. Uh, but I would say, you know, one of the things that I'd like to see happen that we haven't gotten to yet is I would also like to see this apply to for profit development uh, by allowing them to have a little more leeway themselves. If, so currently we have a 20% affordable housing rate in the city. If you build X amount of units, 20% of them have to be affordable. I would be willing to give them a floor or two or more space or more zoning uh, relief if they were to build say 30% affordable housing. Uh, but the problem that you talk about in terms of neighborhoods being disproportionately affected Unfortunately, if you look at the, I, I encourage people to look at the zoning map and look for the color purple because the color purple is basically the only place that affordable housing can get built. And that's basically on the east side of town in Winter Hill. So I, I think, and I'm not willing to eliminate that. I just want my uh, colleagues to add it to their neighborhoods as well, because it, it, we can't, we can't solve the affordable housing crisis without building affordable housing. There's no way around it. And it seems like sometimes uh, certain neighborhoods bear the brunt of it and we need the entire community to be involved. It's a fascinating discussion that's gonna take place, I think in earnest with the public and the council. Um, and quite frankly, I think what's gonna happen is that we'll be able to figure out very, very quickly um, which counselors or NIMBYs and which counselors are for equity and transparency. Because if this new affordable housing overlay system is equitably divided right across the city, I, I don't think you would have a whole lot of opposition to it. But if it does appear as though there are certain counselors who are saying, you know, oh, well, my residents and my property owners, and my business owners, don't want a six story affordable housing district in the middle of Davis Square, I think that council is gonna have a problem. I'm well, not casting dispersions at any one counselor, but. Well, I would say one is, um, it's not just counselors, it's the public in general. Uh, so, you know, the counselors respond to people who say they support affordable housing, but then they don't want it in their neighborhood. And we've seen that numerous times in my lifetime. Uh, but this overlay too, is it is going to be citywide, but the difference is what this would do is say you have in East Somerville, you can have a five story building right now. You can build five stories with 20% affordable housing. We'll say something like, oh, you can build seven stories if it's 100%. Uh, so what'll happen is say just Davis Square, for example, uh, where you can build three stories, you can build five stories there if it's 100% affordable. So it's already kind of, the imbalance is already baked in because of the zoning reform that we already passed. So this will increase the ability for affordable housing to get built citywide, but the neighborhoods that are already allowed to build taller will be the natural places for it to go. So, so even if we pass this and even if it's unanimous and everybody supports it, there are still some inequities built into it. Well, I guess I was a little, I, I was I was a little ahead of my time, Matt, because as you remember, uh, we had a five-acre parcel here in our neighborhood, Maxwell's Green, 
And one of the proposals that I had brought up but was shot down uh, by certain elected officials at that time was, if you give us more affordable housing in that development, we'll allow you to go higher. Um, and unfortunately, at that time, we're talking about 2005, 2007, that was a no-go with certain elected officials. So hopefully that mentality is no longer um, true amongst the well, counselors. I mean, and again, too, like we say the counselors, but I, I, something I have learned uh, in politics is that elected officials are truly a representative of their population. So if you have neighbors who don't want affordable housing, you're probably gonna have an elected official who doesn't want affordable housing. Uh, just because we're trying to respond to the demands and sometimes some voices are louder than others, some voices have more influence, but this has been a continuum problem. I would point to you know the, the Cobble, uh, not Cobble Hill, uh, Clarendon Hill, where one of the solutions I proposed was allow them to build taller. And we actually had the developer tell us, oh, we don't wanna build taller. Um, and then there's just, there's a lot of other examples where, I mean, the, one of the things that first got me into politics, this was before I got in office, but there was an affordable housing development on Highland Ave. Uh, and it was basically like a fourth family house that they wanted to make into six families. And neighbors came out against it because they didn't have enough parking spaces. And, to, and several elected officials at the time came and spoke against it and killed it. And this was affordable housing for formerly homeless families. And that was one of the first times I testified up at City Hall and challenged people on that. And that's what this overlay would do is basically you'd have, an, a, you'd have a building like that, you could build the affordable housing and not have to worry about getting sued because the parking wasn't enough or because uh, you know, the, the people don't like it's too dense or too big. Matt, uh, yeah, Matt, two things. This is what happens when we take a couple of weeks off that we have a lot to talk about and time runs out. Oh yeah. But, but when it comes to that, you know, versus what happened in the city years ago versus what you and the council and some other folks are trying to do, those who forget the history are doomed to repeat it. So my best wishes on the affordable housing, the stuff that you're working on. Congratulations once again, President Matt McLaughlin for the Somerville Media Center. Matt, thank you. We'll see you again soon. All right, thanks for having me. Thanks. For the Somerville Media Center, Joe Lynch. See you next time.